uh, things that exist at the moment. I'm interested in things that may exist in the future. The sorts of technologies that Ron alluded to in some of his remarks towards the end of his talk just now. Um, and these are the sorts of things that I'm interested in making happen, the sorts of uh, molecular and cellular damage that uh, accumulate in life as a side effect of our metabolism, a side effect of being alive in the first place, and which eventually cause various of the age-related pathologies that we're all so familiar with. I'm interested in molecular and cellular therapies that will eliminate, not necessarily completely, but will largely eliminate these various types of damage before they translate into the pathologies that we're all so familiar with, and thereby we'll be able to postpone those pathologies. And as you can see, I'm talking about perhaps giving something in the region of 30 years of extra life to people. But specifically, I'm talking about therapies that will only be begun when people are already in middle age. These are bona fide rejuvenation therapies that actually repair and reverse the accumulated molecular and cellular damage of aging and therefore actually restore the body to a biologically younger age. And that's what most of my work and most of my book is going to tell you all about. However, today, in the few minutes that I have, I thought I would take it one step further because even though... Um, you guys are working with stuff that exists at the moment, I'm sure that you appreciate, like me, that the stuff that we can do at the moment is not enough, and that therapies like this are highly called for and urgent, and the sooner we can develop them, the better. What I'm going to talk about today is my belief that this is not enough either, and that we need to go further, and furthermore, my belief that the news is good, that once we do get this far, it's going to get progressively easier to make subsequent progress. This is the sort of thing that gets me in real trouble with the gerontology establishment. I tend to point out that the achievement of a 30-year increase in lifespan, which is indicated by what I'm saying down here, I've just phrased this in terms of world record lifespan, but corresponding um, statements could be made in terms of average lifespan. Um, a 30-year increase in world record lifespan from the current 122 up to, let's say, 150 is going to be the hard part. And after that, it's going to be sufficiently easy to continue accelerating the efficacy of these rejuvenation therapies that we will be able to achieve indefinite lifespans, around 1,000 years or even more, with technology that will already be almost there by the time we get to 150 and will be achieved in time to get almost those same people, people only a little bit younger, over the hill, so to speak, to being able to have indefinite youth. So why is that? Well, I've just defined this term robust re human rejuvenation as the addition of 30 extra years of healthy life, and therefore also extra total life, to people who are already in middle age, let's say 60 years old, when treatment is begun. That's the key thing, and I think we'll all accept that that's quite a bit more effective than anything that's available today. Now, I've defined this second term. I call it longevity escape velocity. And it's got this rather technical definition, but by the end of these ten minutes, you'll be able to understand what I'm talking about. The rate at which rejuvenation therapies must improve following the achievement of robust human rejuvenation in order to outpace the accumulation of so far irreparable damage, damage that the therapies cannot yet repair. And it goes like this. Now, of course, this diagram here is extremely schematic, so I don't want you to take it too literally, but I think it should get the point across. What I'm describing here is ageing in a nutshell. Ageing is the accumulation of molecular and cellular damage, as I've just said, as side effects of metabolism. Now, the word damage can be thought of as the reciprocal of the word reserve. At age zero, when we're born, we have a large amount of metabolic reserve. We're able to do a lot, and, uh, and when we reach early adulthood, for example, we're at our peak. We have a lot of reserve. As damage accumulates, so essentially reserve is the amount of additional damage that we can afford to accumulate before things start going seriously wrong, before pathologies start to emerge. So in other words, the decline in reserve is exactly the same concept as the accumulation of damage. Now, what I'm depicting by this red line is just a very schematic interpretation of what happens during ageing. Damage accumulates, reserve goes down, eventually we reach a point where pathologies start to emerge, I'm calling this dotted line the frailty threshold, and not long after that, we're dead. And once we're below the frailty threshold, it gets very difficult, as everyone in this room knows well, it gets very difficult indeed to even slow down, let alone stop the progress of these various pathologies. So what I would like to ask you, to tell you first, is what's going to happen if we have therapies that are applied in middle age, 
So this is middle age, right here. And that do not repair damage, but do slow down by, let's say, a factor of two, the amount of additional damage that accumulates. That's the blue line. And it's not nothing. It's better than nothing, certainly. It will, ha it will double the remaining healthy lifespan of these people. Uh, but, of course, in terms of the total lifespan, it doesn't do very much. And once the frailty threshold is, re is reached anyway, then, of course, everything spins out of control in the way that we're so familiar with, and we can't really do much even about the speed. Now the pink line. The pink line is the application of a rejuvenation therapy or a panel of comprehensive rejuvenation therapies. And again, I'm not here talking about something that's perfect. I'm talking about something that's, a, that's of comparable efficacy to the blue line that I spoke about a moment ago. So in the blue line, we were halving the rate of damage accumulation. That's a sort of 50% eff effective treatment. With the pink line, we're halving the existing damage. So the application of the treatment more or less instantaneously removes half of the various molecular and cellular um, problems that we've accumulated, indigestible molecules like oxidized cholesterol or hyperphosphorylated tau in the brain, um, things like uh, cross-links that make our arteries stiffer, those sorts of things. Supposing we had therapies that could reverse half of those things, okay? That's what it would achieve in terms of the overall amount of damage that we had and therefore the overall, am overall amount of reserve that we had left. Now, let's look, let's say, 20 years later. The amount of damage has accumulated to the level it was when the therapies were applied the first time, but we're going to, of course, apply the therapies again. Here's the problem. At this time, people have got maybe 20 years' worth of the damage that was repaired by the therapies, but they've got maybe 80 or 90 years' worth of the hard damage that couldn't be repaired by the therapies. So the next time we apply the therapy, they're not going to be so effective. We hit diminishing returns. And then we had to apply the therapies more and more often, and they're less and less effective, and eventually the frailty threshold is reached anyway. It's a great deal better than just slowing down the damage, but it's not, it's not um, indefinite youth. It's pretty good, though. Now, if you and I were mice, that would be the end of my story, because the time frame here would be maybe a few months, right? The time frame over, for, for the whole of this graph would be only a few years. But you and I are not mice. You and I are humans. We're 30 times longer lifespan than mice. And that means that the period between successive applications of these therapies is long enough for significant advances in technology to be made, very significant advances. 20 years is a long time in technology, including biomedical technology. So what's actually much more likely to happen is what is depicted by the brown line here that the second time we apply the therapies, they won't just fix the types of damage they could fix the first time, 20 years previously. They'll also be able to fix maybe half of the damage that they couldn't fix 20 years previously. So this is what we'll have. We'll have someone who's actually more effectively rejuvenated the second time around, even though the task of doing that rejuvenation had become harder for the reasons I just described. And, of course, that means that we get this scenario in which we don't hit diminishing returns and we can continue to get biologically younger over the long term as we're getting chronologically older, and that really is indefinite youth. That is longevity escape velocity, the ability to improve these therapies fast enough to outpace this diminishing returns problem. And it maintains healthy lifespan indefinitely. Now, is this rate of progress really plausible? Well, just think back to a few other aspects of technology. Here's some data for you. Powered flight. It took a very long time to reach the powered flight equivalent of robust human rejuvenation. These are the Wright brothers doing their thing in 1903. But once we got there, the incremental refinement of those technologies to make them more and more effective was something that proceeded at a really rather steady and impressive rate. Here's Lindbergh just having landed in Paris, having flown the Atlantic. I don't think the Wright brothers thought that was going to happen only 24 years later. Here's the Comet, the first, the first um, commercial jetliner, just 22 years after Lindbergh. And here, of course, is Concorde, just 20 years after that. Things have not, things have more or less ground to a halt since then, but we all know why that is. It's because we can't be bothered. It's because the commercial pressure isn't there anymore. And I think we can safely say that that won't ever happen with regard to things that keep us alive and healthy when the technology is available. So that's pretty good news. Now, um, just recently, I've been working with someone who's a really brilliant um, software engineer in New York to put some more flesh on this general concept of longevity escape velocity. We all know, as I said earlier, that there are these various types of molecular and cellular damage that are ongoingly caused by metabolism and that eventually cause pathology. So we thought, well, actually, let's do an in silico analysis of all of this and actually simulate the, the process of aging as a process of damage accumulation. And remarkably, that's never been done. A number of um, 